Welcome to the SAMSI workshop on directed acyclic graphs. My name is Felix Elward, and I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So this is an introduction to directed acyclic graphs, or DAGs. DAGs provide a powerful and pretty new syntax for causal inference, and they're attractive because they're useful for central tasks in causal inference. They're also surprisingly user-friendly and intuitive, and I even think that they're fun. You might find this workshop useful if you're a social or biomedical researcher who wants to learn about DAGs for their own research. And you might also find this helpful if you're a statistician, methodologist, or computer scientist who's looking for a relatively non-technical introduction that gets to the heart of things quickly. Now, what's a DAG? This is a DAG. The modern literature on DAGs unites two deep strands of methodological research. First, linear path models, which have been around for a century since you know, Sewell writes uh, writings in the 1920s, and which form the basis of structural equation modeling or SEM in economics and the social sciences today. Second, DAGs bring in Bayesian networks, which were developed in computer science to graphically represent the statistical dependencies between variables. What's more, DAGs are compatible with the potential outcomes framework of causal inference and are often used alongside it. Now, it's probably fair to say that DAGs dominate research on causal inference in computer science today and are increasingly popular also in fields and applied fields uh, ranging from the biomedical to the social sciences. Obviously, um, uh, a short workshop like this can't replace a longer course, much less a careful study of the technical literature. So instead of crossing the T's and dotting the I's, this workshop aims at doing two things. First, I want to survey the three main formal uses of DAGs. These uses are to graphically notate the assumed data generating process. Second, to infer associations from causation. Third, to infer causation from association. And in the process, we're gonna learn uh, the building blocks of DAGs, key terminology, and the uh, important uh, concept of deseparation, the adjustment criterion and the gesturing of the famous do calculus. Second, this workshop aims to give a variety of examples, real examples, to illustrate the usefulness of DAGs for understanding thorny problems in applied statistics and data analysis. Uh, ultimately, I hope that this introduction will motivate listeners to use DAGs in their own work, uh, or at least to have some fun reading more of the literature on DAGs, which is really active and exciting these days. Good. So let's, uh, um, let's start with the first main use of DAGs, namely notating the assumed data generating process. Why would we want to do that? Well, it's a fact of a causal inference that all causal inferences that are drawn from data are drawn relative to an assumed state of the world, relative to a model, relative to assumptions about the data generating process. There are various ways to notate these assumptions. Uh, some, of them, some of them are more accessible than others. DAGs have proven to be very accessible uh, uh, for, uh, for applied researchers and non-technical audiences uh, recently. Uh, so that's uh, as good a reason as any to learn about DAGs, right? To, to communicate assumptions to audiences. But uh, uh, DAGs have also been uh, a really powerful engine of methodological development uh, in statistics and in computer science. Um, among experts, so that's a second good reason to learn about DAGs. So, what's in a DAG? DAGs 
um, if nothing else, are pictures that encode the analyst's qualitative causal assumptions about the data generating process. Specifically, a DAG uh, uh, notates what variables are assumed to cause each other and what variables are not assumed to cause another. So if you will, DAGs are as an especially efficient way of notating qualitative causal assumptions. And graphically, they're simply pictures of how the world works. Now, DAGs have three ingredients. First, DAGs consist of a node set. These nodes, which I will represent as um, capital letters, um, represent random variables. These variables may be observed or unobserved. Second, DAGs contain a set of arrows or directed edges. These arrows represent possible direct causal effects. Third, and very importantly, DAGs contain missing arrows, which of course you only see by implication. Missing arrows represent absent direct causal effects. So let me say something about these potential effects and the absent effects. Okay, so what's, what certainly, what, um, what enables us to draw causal inferences is um, from data are exclusion restrictions. Exclusion restrictions are assumptions about uh, missing effects. Okay, so these missing arrows are exclusion restrictions and can be shown, and it's widely known, of course, that without exclusion assumptions, one cannot point identify causal effects from data. So these missing arrows are really, really important. The missing arrows represent sharp assumptions. What about the existing arrows then? In practice, existing arrows are usually read as existing effects. But technically, these arrows actually represent ignorance. So my drawing an arrow from x to t in this graph notates that I'm not willing to exclude the possibility that x causes t for at least one individual. Okay, so if you will, these arrows represent ignorance. They represent my unwillingness to exclude the absence of an effect of x on t. For the technically inclined, this is an important detail. Uh, for most practical purposes, it's perfectly okay if you read an arrow from x to t as a claim that x causes t for at least one person in the population. The absent arrows, however, for example, the absent arrow from u to t notates my assumption, my knowledge, my belief, which is all the same thing really, that u does not directly cause t for anybody in the population. Let me illustrate what this means with a little example from social epidemiology. Suppose we're interested in the relationship between smoking, T, um, and mortality, Y. Now this graph consists of one, two, three, four, five variables, okay? U represents unmeasured accidents during childhood. X represents poverty, T is smoking, C is cancer, Y is death. Now what this graph says is first, smoking causes cancer. So T has an arrow into C. Second, cancer causes mortality. So there's an arrow from C into Y. Furthermore, we assert that poverty X causes both smoking and cancer directly 
Okay, so smoking has two effects on cancer. First, uh, uh, po excuse me, poverty has two effects on cancer. First, poverty causes cancer indirectly by causing smoking. Second, poverty causes cancer directly uh, through mechanisms other than smoking, for example, uh, by exposing um, poor individuals to um, residential or workplace toxins. Finally, we assert that childhood accidents, which you know, for the sake of the argument are unmeasured, cause poverty and may also directly cause mortality through mechanisms other than poverty smoking, and cancer. Okay, so that's the story. Um, now, if we'd written out what I just said in words, that would be about a half manuscript page. So if nothing else, DAGs are a really efficient way of telling a qualitative causal story. Instead of writing out you know, a half page on how these, uh, these five variables affect each other, I can simply draw this pretty little picture and convey the very same qualitative causal information. Now, this picture conveys additional information, namely what variables are assumed to not cause each other, right? This DAG contains exclusion restrictions. Specifically here, uh, to just pick one example, um, uh, there's a bunch of uh, arrows missing, and one arrow that's missing is a direct arrow from T to Y. Huh? This graph says that smoking, so by, by um, um, not containing this arrow, this graph asserts that smoking causes mortality only via cancer. Now remember, all causal claims that we make based on data are actually also made relative to an assumed data generating process. Data alone is dumb. Data alone cannot speak to causality, but data together with a data generating model may allow us to speak to causality. Now, what does that mean? It means that we actually need to know something about the structure of the data generating process. DAGs notate um, uh, what must be known about the data generating process, namely the qualitative causal structure. Now, if my assumptions about the data generating process are wrong, then the inferences that I may draw from data relative to that model may also be incorrect. Therefore, it's really important to interrogate a DAG that you're given for its accuracy. So you have to figure out whether the DAG uh, is credible with respect to the arrows that it does contain and the arrows that it does not contain. For our example specifically here, I think you'll agree that this DAG is not credible. It's not credible because it claims that smoking causes mortality only via cancer. So it's like the analyst here has never heard of emphysema. Um, so to the medical crowd, uh, this is not going to be credible. And hence, um, if you don't believe this graph, you really have no reason to believe any empirical causal claims that I make conditional on this model. So what's the conclusion? If we want to analyze data to figure out effects of smoking on cancer and mortality and what have you, then this is probably not your graph. You probably have to change this graph to make it credible, to make it pa pass the smell test. Good. So now we know how to draw a DAG and I've also jumped up and down metaphorically here to emphasize that a, a graph is only going to do you any good if you actually believe in the story that it tells. <laughs>
Now, um, the graph that I've shown you was pretty desic desiccated. Small node said relatively few arrows. Why is that? Well, sometimes there are variables I don't have to draw. So let me talk about idiosyncratic structural errors now. Most variables in this fine world have lots of causes. The unmeasured causes affecting each variable are called the structural error term of a variable. An idiosyncratic structural error term includes all unobserved variables that only affect one measured variable in your graph. Now, the cool thing is that by convention, idiosyncratic error terms of the observed variables in the DAG are not themselves included in the DAG. So here we have two graphs on the left and on the right. And these two graphs convey the exact same information. On the right, we've explicitly notated the idiosyncratic error terms of each variable. For example, E of X with an arrow into X represents all the unmeasured variables that affect X alone, but not Z or not Y directly. Okay? And of course, every variable is gonna have a bunch of idiosyncratic unobserved causes. Now, because these unobserved idiosyncratic causes never help with non-parametric um, causal identification, we usually don't draw them and we leave them implicit. So by convention, the graph on the left actually encodes the exact same information as the graph on the right. It's just the graph on the left didn't draw the idiosyncratic error terms. Now, sometimes, however, or perhaps very often, some unmeasured variable u may affect two or more variables in your data generating process. For example, there may be a variable u that affects both z and y. Now, because u is unobserved, u is in the error term of both variables, so that we say that z and y have correlated errors. In contrast to idiosyncratic errors, correlated errors have to be drawn explicitly. Different authors, different fields have different conventions for notating idiosyncratic error terms. Here I'm giving you three different notations, but they're all equivalent. What all, each of these three notations say is that there's an unobserved variable that directly affects both Z and Y. And that leads to their errors being correlated. Again, correlated errors have to be drawn. In this workshop, I'm mostly gonna use the first convention of explicitly drawing the unobservable, where of course, uh, the unobservable could represent a vector of unobservables. All of, all of the nodes here could represent vectors um, of uh, structurally uh, equivalent uh, variables. Good. Now, uh, in what follows, we generally must assume that the DAG is a so-called causal DAG. What's a causal DAG? A causal DAG is a DAG that includes all observed and unobserved common causes of any two or more variables already drawn in the DAG. Let's look at this DAG here. So if this DAG is supposed to be a causal DAG, then we're asserting, among other things, that say cancer, C, and mortality, Y, share no observed or unobserved common causes besides X. 
X clearly is a common cause of C and Y because X has direct arrows into C and Y. But X is also the only variable in this graph that is a common cause of C and Y. If I'm asserting that this is a causal DAG, then I'm saying that there's no other variable besides poverty that directly causes cancer and mortality. And once more, the medical folks among you might say, hey, Felix, that's not a credible assumption. We need to redraw this DAG. And I would say, hey, thank you for letting me know. Um, we want this DAG to be state of the art, representing the, the most current the scientific knowledge. So yeah, we should redraw this if you don't believe it. Now, um, uh, to proceed, from now on, we're gonna assume that all the DAGs that I'm gonna show you are causal DAGs in this sense. And clearly that is to make a very, very strong assumption. You know? It's a strong assumption in the sense that it's often problematic. Now, don't blame the messenger here. One of the advantages, I think, of working with DAGs is that they make um, problematic assumptions painfully obvious. So here, once I've told really any audience, uh, statisticians or you know, uh, people who've never taken a stats course in their life, I tell them, hey, this graph is supposed to represent a certain corner of the world and I'm asserting that it includes all common causes of any two variables in this graph. Then any sane audience will briefly be taken aback, perhaps for a long time be taken aback and say, this can't possibly be the case. Your model must be more complicated. And you know, as, as a data analyst, uh, you should say, yeah, that's, uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's, it's really good that the audience understands the generally uh, very strong assumptions that need to go into a causal inference because we don't want to lull our audience into a false sense of security. We want to be transparent about the assumptions that we have to make. And I just happen to believe that drawing pictures of the qualitative structure of the data generating process is a really efficient way of highlighting the, uh, the empirical meaning of our assumptions. Okay, so we're gonna assume that henceforth. Now, um, uh, for this gathering of SAMC, um, we're of course trying to uh, have a conversation between people that come from DAG world and people that come from structural equations. So here, I just wanna say a little bit about the relationships between um, uh, uh, DAGs and say traditional path models before I talk more generally about structural equation models. The fact is that uh, DAGs are a generalization of traditional linear path models which have been around for a hundred years. Put differently, path models are a very, very special, special case of DAGs. The difference between the two is that path models assume that the data are generated by a linear model in which the causal effect of one variable on another is the exact same for every individual. So we might also say that linear path models represent linear and homogeneous DGPs. Now, uh, there are virtues of assuming linear path models. Um, uh, the first one being that uh, the, the math of linear models is really well understood and by making such incredibly strong assumptions such as linearity and homogeneity, we can re usually defend very strong conclusions uh, under these assumptions. The drawback of working with linear and homogeneous models is that these assumptions uh, are often not justified in empirical applications in the social and biomedical sciences because, I mean, you know, uh, free drinks for the person who. Uh, 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 who gives me the first credible example of a data generating process where all the effects are linear and have the same size for everybody. <laughs> These, that's, that's not the world I live in, but uh, maybe you have an application where that's, that's the case. Now, what's more, 
In traditional path analysis, uh, analysts often assume that the node set is jointly normal, which is another highly suspect um, assumption that at least in my corner of the social sciences is scarcely justified. So now come DAGs. DAGs, as I mentioned, are a generalization of path models. DAGs, in fact, are completely non-parametric objects. They're non-parametric in two senses. First, DAGs make no distributional assumptions about the nodes. These variables in the DAG can have any distribution. Z could be normal, X could be Bernoulli, Y could be Gumbel extreme value. I mean, I don't care. DAGs are a system that are built so that any conclusion that we draw relative to a DAG will be true for essentially um, all PDFs with, uh, uh, that, that comply to the, to the structure of the graph in a sense that I'll explicate in a little bit. Okay, so let me say that again. Um, if we're gonna analyze a graph, a small graph like this, or uh, a big graph with you know, 100 variables, the conclusions that we're gonna draw from those exercises are gonna be valid regardless of the distribution of the nodes. Second, the second sense in which DAGs are non-parametric is that they contain no functional form assumptions. So the arrows in this graph, for example, the causal effect of X on Y could be linear, could be quadratic, could be wildly non-linear, even non-differentiable for all I care. Um, and of course, the effect of X and Y could vary across individuals, right? So these effects could be homogenous or heterogeneous. So that too is a way in which these DAGs are much more general than conventional path models. Now this makes DAGs a very general tool. They're a tool that's designed to notate exclusively the qualitative causal structure of the assumed DGP. They're not used for notating um, uh, distributional or functional form assumptions. They're completely non-parametric. Now, there's pros and cons to this generality. The pro is that conclusions drawn from DAGs are not gonna hinge on parametric assumptions. That's really good news, I think, because parametric assumptions are often deeply suspect in the social and biomedical sciences. The downside of the generality of DAGs, of course, is that, um, uh, that sometimes we can't draw desired conclusions in the absence of, um, of parametric assumptions. So if we, if we, you know, later in this workshop, if we found out that um, a certain causal effect isn't non-parametrically identifiable with uh, relative to our non-parametric DAG, then we might uh, want to sort of cautiously start asserting parametric assumptions. Maybe you're willing to assert linearity. Maybe you're willing to assert joint, uh, sorry, joint normality or linearity. And of course, the more assumptions we make about the parametric structure of the model, the more conclusions we can draw. That's just a fact of life. Stronger assumptions warrant stronger conclusions. It's just that we don't wanna start with these strong assumptions. We wanna start with a minimally necessary assumption, which is the qualitative causal structure of the DGP notated in the DAG. Now with all that, we've just defined path models and DAGs as visual representations of the structural equations that are assumed to have generated the data. 
So here I have two graphs. They're basically the same, except that the graph on the left represents a linear path model. So um, uh, this graph is equivalent to this linear structural equation model down here, okay. which says that all the variables in this graph have been generated by linear and homogeneous equations, right? There's, it says the world is linear and homogeneous. The DAG, by contrast, makes the same qualitative claims as the linear path model, but only qualitatively so. So this DAG here is one-to-one -one equivalent to this non-parametric structural equation model down here. Non-parametric structural equation model or NPSEM. Okay, good. So what does this non-parametric structural equation model says? Well, it says the exact same thing as the DAG. So what does the DAG say? The DAG says that Z is caused by a bunch of unobserved idiosyncratic factors summarized in E of Z. Well, that's what the equation down here says as well. Z is generated by E of Z. Good. What does the DAG say about X? The DAG says X is caused by all the variables that have a direct arrow into it. That's the error term and Z. Okay, good. So that's what the equation down here says. X is some function f of X, which may vary across individuals, um, that take uh, the parents of X, all the variables that have direct arrow into X as input. And finally, what does the DAG says about how Y is generated? Well, Y is generated by X, Z, and a bunch of unobservables in the error term on Y. That's the exact same thing that our structural, non-parametric structural equation down here says. Y is generated by some function F of Y that takes Z, X, and E of Y as, um, as arguments. So F of Y simply says that there is some function that transforms the parents of the variable y into y itself. And that variable, that, that function f of y is completely unconstrained, except for its arguments. Um, and in that sense, it's a non-parametric function that's almost certainly not known to us. The only thing we know is that it, this function takes z, x, and e of y as an argument. Now, um, because f of y is so general, it may well contain interactions between the various arguments in f and y. Okay, so there, y could be, you know, generated by this linear function that we had on the left, but it could also be generated by, you know, uh, say g plus c, z, x, log of x square. I mean, who cares? It could be any function really. And that's a good thing because now we don't have to worry about the parametric structure of our model. Now, <clears throat> why are DAGs DAGs? Why are they, or rather, why are DAGs A? Why are DAGs acyclic? No, DAGs are acyclic in the sense that they don't contain directed cycles of arrows, such as this thing here. This is a directed cyclic arrow where A causes C, C causes B, and B causes A. We don't really worry much about cyclic DAGs because causal cycles don't exist in the real world. They don't exist because causation flows in time. Okay, so it must be the case, I hope you'll agree, that a cause has to precede its effect. Now this graph here doesn't obey that rule. This graph says A causes C and hence A comes before C. 
C causes B and hence C comes before B and B causes A and hence B comes before A. But that's a contradiction, right? So now we're saying, really what we're saying that in this graph is that the future causes the past. There's time travel and that can't be. Now, many of you uh, who are watching this will immediately come up with apparent counterexamples. Okay, I respect that. Most counterexamples can be immediately resolved by simply telling the story a little more carefully in time. So in my experience, almost all apparent cycles are resolved by recognizing that people are telling stories about or providing theories that involve multiple states of a given variable and that these states evolve over time, right? So it could be that A at time one affects C at time two affects B at time three affects A at time four. So let's do all of us a favor and just write out, let's articulate the DAG in time by having separate random variables for different temporal states of the variables properly subscripted. Now the DAG might get messy real quick um, and there are shortcuts, of course, in the technical literature, but for our intents, uh, for, for our purposes here, um, uh, let's, let's look at DAGs because we can already do a lot with DAGs. There is some theory for cyclic DAGs, also for DAGs where some of the edges are not um, oriented or maybe fully undirected graphs. But naturally these uh, graphs support weaker conclusions because they make weaker assumptions. Um, I refer you to the technical literature for that. The main point here is DAGs don't contain cycles because cycles, directed cycles, would imply that the future caused the past and that doesn't happen in our world. Okay, so much for notation. What we've learned so far is how to notate our assumptions about the data generating process in a graph. And now we're gonna go to the second main purpose of DAGs. We are going to infer association from causation. So here's how this works. Having notated the causal structure of the DGP graphically, we can now infer what associations should exist, should be observable in the data if the graph represented the true DGP. This is known as deriving the associational implications of a model. In other words, we ask if our graph captures the process that generated the data, what variables should be asso associated with each other and what variables should not be associated with each, uh, with each other in our data. So in this section, we now build up to understanding the engine that connects the causal assumptions of the DAG to the statistical associations and independencies in observed data and that hence drives DAG world. And that's the concept of de-separation. So on this slide, I just want to summarize the logic of what's to come. Okay, so on this slide, uh, I'm just asserting a bunch of things that I hope will guide your attention as we then uh, introduce the building blocks of de-separation. So here it is, simple rules. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the powerful things about DAGs is that really simple rules connect the causal assumptions that we've notated in the DAG to the statistical associations in data. And the logic goes like this. First, we believe that causal effects in a DGP give rise to observable associations in data. That's an axiom that's low hanging fruit, right? If one variable causes the other, they're gonna be associated. More generally, we say that associations flow along paths. By contrast, excuse me, I misspoke. All associations flow along 
open paths. By contrast, closed paths do not transmit associations. Finally, we just have to learn three rules of association to determine whether a path is open or closed. Now, in the following slides, I'll define these terms and then lead up to what's probably the most important technical concept in DAG world, namely deseparation. And all that deseparation does is to consolidate our three rules of association. Okay, so first a bit of terminology. Let's define what's a path. Technically, a path between two variables is a non-self-intersecting sequence of adjacent edges. That's a mouthful. Really what the sentence is saying is that a path is exactly what you think it is. A path from, say, X to Y is just a journey that you traverse through adjacent edges, so edges that connect to each other. Two things are important about the definition. First, the direction of the arrows does not matter. So X, T, Y is a path where we just follow the path where we follow all the arrows along the direction of the arrows. But XTU is also a path, even though we're going against the direction of the arrow. Okay, so it doesn't matter what direction you go, which direction you travel the arrow, it's a path. The second thing that matters about paths is that they can't self-intersect. So that means that as you journey along a path, you're not allowed to touch the same variable twice. So let me give you an example. Here's a path, T to Y. That's a path, T to Y. By contrast, T to Y to U to T to Y, that's not a path because I've touched a T twice. Let me give you another example. Here's a path. T to X is a path. But T to Y to U to T to X, that's not a path because I've touched T twice. Okay, good. So that's easy to remember. A path is what you think it is. You can go uh, uh, you don't have to worry about the direction of the arrows. You just can't go in cycles. Now, we want to lead up to causal inference, of course. So when you do causal inference, you always have at least one treatment and at least one outcome. In this workshop, I'm going to work with, um, with scalar treatments and scalar outcomes. Now, with respect to a given treatment outcome pair, every path between them is either causal or non-causal. Let's define that. A causal path between a treatment and an outcome is a path in which all arrows point away from treatment and toward the outcome. So in this graph here, there's only one causal path from T to Y, namely T to Y. A non-causal path between a treatment and an outcome is any path that's not a causal path. That is to say, if you have a path between treatment and the outcome, that you have to travel against the arrow for at least one segment, then you're on a non-causal path. So here we have two non-causal paths between T and Y. T X Y and T U Y. It's easy to remember what's a non-causal path because a non-causal path involves time travel. You have to go against the direction of the arrow at least once. Now, why do we care? We care about the distinction between causal and non-causal paths because the union of causal paths between a treatment and an outcome comprises the total causal effect of the treatment on the outcome. 
So the causal paths are the carriers of our causal effects. By contrast, the non-causal paths are potential carriers of spurious associations. That's why you may also call these non-causal paths biasing paths. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. Let's do the little exercise. We've already done the first, but I'm going to repeat it. If my treatment is T and my outcome is Y, then there's only one causal path, T to Y, right? It's a causal path because I go strictly away from treatment, strictly toward the outcome. And there are two non-causal paths, TXY and TUY. These are non-causal paths because I go against the direction of the arrow at least once. Now let's go back to our smoking and cancer graph. Suppose now that I'm interested in the causal effect of poverty on mortality. So X is my treatment and Y is my outcome. Then I have three causal paths. There's the direct arrow from X to Y. Then there's the path X, C, Y and the path X, T, C, Y. So the causal effect of poverty and mortality in this model goes through three channels, one direct and two indirect. Now there's another path here, but that's a non-causal path. The single non-causal path from X to Y goes X, U, Y. Now, sometimes you'll hear the term backdoor paths in causal analysis in, 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 in DAG world. A backdoor path between a treatment and an outcome is a path that begins with an arrow into treatment. Okay, so here there are two backdoor paths from two, T to Y, they're both non causal. And in this graph, we have one backdoor path into X. Okay, good. Um, uh, there's good reasons to worry about backdoor paths. We're not going to do that in this workshop. For our purposes here, I think uh, for pedagogical purposes, it's more useful to stick with the differentiation between causal and non-causal paths. more terminology, collider variables. Collider variables are key for working with DAGs. And should you have printed out these slides, I encourage you to dog ear the slide and to notate it, uh, to, to highlight it with you know, magic marker and glitter glue or whatever you or your children have uh, available at present. Um, Colliders are key. So what's a collider? All right. So suppose you have a path. When two arrows on a given path directly point into a variable on that path, then that variable is a collider variable on that path. Again, if you have a path, and two arrowheads collide in one variable on that path, then that variable is a collider variable on the path. The important fact though is that any given, on any given path, any one variable is either a collider or a non-collider. So, um, Let's look at this. Let's look at the variable T on the path X, T, U, Y. On this path, X, T, U, Y, T is a collider variable because two arrowheads collide in T. By contrast, on the path X, T, Y, T is not a collider because in that path, X, T, Y, two arrowheads do not collide in T. Okay. 
So that's important. Colliders are always defined relative to a given path. Colliders are path specific. It is this fact that um, I think accounts for the great majority of uh, mistakes in working with DAGs. The mistake would be to forget that a collider is always defined relative to a path and that a given variable can be a collider on one path and a non-collider on another path. Now, with all that, let's ask which paths transmit and which paths do not transmit association. And we'll start with the primitives. It turns out that all marginal and conditional associations originate from just three causal structures, causation, confounding, and selection. Here are those structures. First, two variables, A and B, are going to be associated with each other if A causes B directly or indirectly. That makes sense, right? If A causes B, A and B are going to be associated. Second, suppose that A does not cause B. Well, then A and B may still be associated if they share a common cause. That's the structure of confounding. Okay. A and B don't cause each other, but they share a common cause, which induces a dependency between them. That's also intuitive. But there's a third reason why two variables may be associated with each other. Look again at A and B in the third graph. Here, A and B do not cause each other. And they share no common cause. And yet, the two variables will be associated with each other almost always if we condition on their common effect. This is the structure of selection bias. Okay, so in, in epidemiology, it's called selection bias. In sociology, it's called endogenous selection bias. We mean the same thing. Um, so um, let, me, uh, let me explain, uh, let me make that third claim again. So what happens is that when we condition on a collider, we induce an association between its immediate causes. It's kind of wild. So here's the structure of that claim again. We have A and B. They don't cause each other and they share no common cause. Therefore, A and B are going to be marginally independent. But if we condition on their common effect, which of course is going to be a collider on a path between A and B, if we condition on their common effect, then we're going to induce an association between A and B. Obviously, that association is spurious. Okay. Now, cognitive psychologists tell us that uh, understanding these kind of collider stratification problems, selection bias, is apparently one of the hardest things about uh, causal cognition in humans. Um, so don't worry if this seems wild, uh, but it's a fact. Um, and it's a really common fact, which you know, I suppose is documented by the fact that uh, this phenomenon, the, you know, that conditioning on a collider induces an association between its immediate causes, gets discovered and rediscovered with astounding regularity. Um, in a paper, that wrote a few years ago with Chris Winship, we had a footnote that found seven common uh, terms for this type of bias. And in ep epidemiology, I know there are even more uh, terms for this type of bias. Uh, 
for example, Berkson's bias has this structure, but also ascertainment bias um, and other types of, of selection bias. Good. Now, uh, I, I don't want to derive this fact, uh, uh, you know, with, with formulas in math, uh, because I don't think this aids intuition. Well, in my experience, it doesn't. Um, but uh, let me give you some examples to uh, elucidate the structure of this claim. So I'm going to start with Perl's canonic sprinkler example. I'm going to start with that because, in addition to being, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the most important uh, theorists of uh, methodologists of causal inference of the 20th century, uh, Judea Perl is also one of these people who have this talent of coming up with killer examples that are impossible to forget. I want to get, now, uh, I'd be remiss to uh, keep Pearl's sprinkler example from you. So here's the story. I'm going to simplify uh, his story slightly to just reduce it to three variables. So we're interested in the process that gets my lawn wet. C equals one means my lawn is getting wet. C equals zero means my lawn is, getting, is not getting wet. Now there are two ways that my lawn could get wet. First, could be raining. Second, my sprinkler could be on. Now, the interesting thing about my sprinkler is that it's on a random timer. Therefore, raining and sprinklering are marginally independent. That means if you know that it's raining, you can't tell if my sprinkler's on or not. Sorry. From the fact that it's raining, you can't infer whether my sprinkler's on or not because my sprinkler's on a random timer. Conversely, if I'm telling you that my sprinkler is off, you still can't tell if it's raining or not because my sprinkler comes on at random hours of the day. It's random, it carries no information about anything else. So that's what it means for two variables to be independent. Knowing the value of one, A, tells you nothing about the value of the other, B. A and B are statistically independent. But here's the amazing thing. Let's condition on the common effect of rain and sprink sprinkler now. That is, let's look only at those moments in world history where my lawn is getting wet. Now, if you already know that my lawn is getting wet and I'm telling you that it's not raining, well, suddenly, you know that my sprinkler is on. Conversely, again, knowing that my lawn's currently getting wet, if I'm telling you that my sprinkler is off, that means that it must be raining. So that's amazing. Knowing something about the common effect of A and B allows me to make inferences about A from knowing B and vice versa. That's what it means for two variables to be conditionally associated. Conditional on knowing something about the value of the collider C. Knowing something about the value of B allows me to make an inference about the value of A for at least one uh, uh, combination of values of these three variables. Yeah. And this, as we'll see later in this workshop, this phenomenon is everywhere. Let me give you another example that uh, perhaps will be entertaining to the graduate students in the audience. Uh, I assure you this example was a lot funnier uh, before I got tenure myself, um, uh, but uh, I like it. So here we go. So suppose now that we study the process by which faculty get tenure, it's lifetime appointments, at uh, American universities. Suppose for argument's sake that there are two ways that one could get tenure. Being really productive is sufficient for getting tenure or, or being really original is sufficient for getting tenure. Suppose further that in the population of budding scholars, originality and productivity are independent. That is to say, knowing that somebody can ride up a storm doesn't uh, 
tell us anything about whether they are original or not. And knowing that somebody has original ideas doesn't tell us anything about whether they're actually getting any of that stuff published. Good. Suppose that's the truth. Okay, again, I'm making inferences relative to a data generating model. Of course, I'm giving you a very simplified model here, but it serves the purpose of pedagogical clarity. Now, what happens if we only look among tenured faculty? Even if originality and productivity are marginally independent in the population of scholars, among tenured faculty, originality and productivity are gonna be associated with each other. Let's play that out. So if you know that somebody's gotten tenure and you know they've never had a single original thought in their life. Well, you're reasonably going to conclude that they're a publishing machine, right? They got tenure. If they couldn't have gotten tenure because of originality, they must have gotten tenure because of productivity. Conversely, if uh, they have tenure, but they've really not been very productive at all, well, then it stands to reason that the papers that they have published were stunningly original. So here, once more, we have the fact that conditioning on a collider induces an association between its immediate causes. In our sort of highly simplified, and I hope not too offensive story, among tenured faculty, if my model here is true, you would have to see a negative association between productivity and originality. But I could tweak the model to make it so that there's a positive association. Either way, there would be an association between A and B. It's remarkable, isn't it? Now, um, I wanna emphasize that confounding and selection are different things. So suppose that A is treatment and B is the outcome. Suppose further that A does not cause B. Then confounding bias would result in this first model where we have failed to condition on a common cause, right? So A and B in this model would be associated even though A does not cause B because we failed to condition on this confounder. That's the structure of confounding bias. By contrast, selection bias arises because we've mistakenly conditioned on a common effect. So we see here that confounding and selection are really the polar opposite of each other. They result from different analytic actions conditioning versus not conditioning, with respect to different causal structures, a fork versus an inverted fork. And they also have different solutions. The solution to confounding bias is to condition on a common cause. The solution to selection bias is to not condition on a common effect. Now, of course, we all know that various literatures use confounding and selection interchangeably in the way they define these terms, that's perfectly okay. But I think for our purposes, for really any causal purposes, it's really helpful to keep these three sources of association distinct. Once we understand these three sources of association, we can understand all associations that arise from causal models. Now, I said there's three sources of association. I lied. There's a sort of a rule 3.5, namely that conditioning on a descendant of a collider also induces an association between the collider's immediate causes. Okay, the intuition for that is straightforward. So, so we know that conditioning on the collider itself induces an association between A and B. So now suppose that we don't have C, but we have a variable that's caused by C, a descendant of C. You know, so uh, D would be a noisy measure of C. Well, clearly uh, 
D contains lots of information about C, so conditioning on D will also qualitatively create the same problem, namely inducing an association between the collider's immediate causes. Good, but now we really got everything and we can go to D separation. We now have everything we need. Um, so, so far we've tried to understand associations between uh, variables in three variable DAGs. Now we're gonna learn Perl's famous D separation rule, which allows us to determine whether arbitrarily long and complicated paths transmit or don't transmit associations. I think it it's fair to say that deseparation is the most important concept in DAG world. So here we go. A path is said to be deseparated or blocked or closed by a set of nodes Z, if and only if the path contains a chain or a fork with M as the middle node, such that Z is in M or if the path contains an inverted fork and neither M nor any of its descendants are in Z. Conversely, a path is said to be deconnected or open or unblocked if and only if it's not deseparated. The D in deseparation stands for directional, okay, but that's not important anymore. So let's look at this formal definition, right? So, um, so far I've talked about three rules of association. Now suddenly comes this monster of a definition. But really, if you take a little time, you know, stop the recording and, and parse the sentence, you will see that really deseparation hardly contains anything new beyond what we've already said. Let's investigate, let's look at this definition again. So we say that a path is deseparated or blocked by some variable z, if that path contains a chain or a fork. Now what's a chain or a fork? A chain, A to M to B, there's, that just says that A causes B indirectly via M. Now clearly, if um, uh, we condition on the middle node, then we block the flow of association from A to B. What's the second red uh, um, primitive here? Well, that's our confounding graph, isn't it? Here we have two variables A and B that are jointly caused by M. So M is a confounder. And what D separation says is that if you, that if M is, uh, is conditioned on, then there's no association flowing from A to B. Third, we have the third possible primitive, A and B where M is a collider between A and B. Well, here we're saying that as long as we don't condition on M, there's no association flowing between A and B. A and B are marginally independent, All right? So what D separation does is just takes these three rules of association, puts them together into a single long sentence. Let me translate that sentence into words. Oh, sorry, no, no, um, one more thing. Now, strictly speaking, deseparation is a graphical property, right? So uh, we can view these DAGs as just objects, um, graph, and we can ask about certain proper, and we can define properties of this graph. That's what deseparation does. But now, we don't really care about the graphical properties of this picture, we care about data. So that's why we need the verma perl theorem to relate deseparation, a graphical criterion, to statistical associations, something that we can measure in, in data. Specifically, what verma and perl showed is that under mild conditions, in data generated according to the causal DAG, where Z is conditioned on, a path does not transmit association if it is deseparated by Z. Okay. 
and a path may transmit association if it is deconnected. Cool. The implication of this is that two variables are statistically independent if there's no open path between them. And two variables may be statistically associated if there's at least one open path between them. So if you're watching this recording, you may want to review that, but we're gonna do some exercises now. So let's do, ah, sorry, I jumped ahead, but we're still not doing exercises. I'm gonna translate this. So whether a path between two variables is open or closed, depends on whether the analyst does or does not condition on a collider or a non-collider variable. There are two locking rules, which together comprise deseparation. The first rule says that conditioning on any non-collider on a path locks the path. And the second rule says that not conditioning on at least one collider on a path, nor any of its descendants, also blocks the path. And then deconnectedness is just the converse of, uh, sorry, of, of deseparation. Deconnection is the converse of deseparation. That's rule three. Not conditioning on any non colliders and conditioning on all colliders or on at least one descendant of each collider on a path opens the path. This, this sounds like this sounds like a rap music, right? Not conditioning on any non-colliders, conditioning on all colliders, or at least one descendant of each collider on a path opens the path. I promise you, though, if you really internalize these three rules, you can do magic with graphs. This is the engine that drives working with graphs. Knowing whether a path is deconnected or not tells us whether it transmits association. And hence, we can use deconnection to figure out if two variables are associated or not. Here's some quick exercises, okay? Suppose that this causal DAG represents the true DGP. My first question is, are T and U associated marginally? Now we know from what we've seen before that T and U are going to be associated if there's at least one open path between them. Is there such an open path? Yes, there is. The, the path U directly to T is open. Great. Second question, are X and Y associated marginally? Marginal means without conditioning on anything. Yeah, they are. From what we've said before, we know that X and Y are gonna be associated marginally if there's at least one open path between them. Well, in this ca case, there's two open paths between X and Y, the direct arrow X to Y and the indirect arrow X T Y. Both of these paths are open because we don't condition on anything and these paths don't contain colliders. Third, are X and U associated marginally? They're not. Okay, so again, if I'm asking are X and U associated marginally, I'm asking is there any open path between them? So let's enumerate all possible paths between X and U. There are three paths between X and U. All three of them are closed. Here they are. First, we have the path X, T, U. That path is closed because the path contains a collider, T, and we're not conditioning on that collider. Second, there is the path X, Y, U. That path is closed too, because the path contains Y. Y is a collider, and we don't condition on that collider. Third, there's the path X, T, Y, U. 
This path is closed also because it contains the collider Y and we don't condition on the collider. Okay, so that means in sum that if our graph captured the true DGP of our data, then in our data, we should observe that X and U are marginally independent. Now, what, however, if we conditioned on T? So that's our last question here. Are X and U associated after conditioning on T? The answer is yes. X and U are gonna be associated conditional on T if there's at least one open path between them. Now conditioning on T opens that path. Look at the path X, T, U. On that path, T is a collider. Conditioning on a collider opens the path. So now we have an open path from X via T to you and X and U are gonna be conditionally associated given T. Now, right now, um, if this is the first time you've heard this, I'm sure it's gonna be hard to follow this immediately. You might want to stop at some point after we've done more exercises and review this material and see if you can reproduce these examples. Internalizing these rules takes a little bit of time, takes a little bit of practice but I swear it is gonna be time well spent. Now let's apply what we've just learned to a real problem, namely the problem of mediation analysis. Suppose that our DAG here captures the true DGP. You'll note that this DAG is the exact same DAG we've just analyzed, except I've renamed some variables for reasons that you'll see shortly. So what does this DAG actually represent in the real world? It represents a scenario where S is randomized, right? S may be a randomized intervention because S does not receive any other arrows in this causal graph. So for that to happen, S really has to be randomized. Now S causes Y via two pathways, the direct effect and the indirect effect. The indirect effect is mediated by L. L, however, is not randomized, so it likely shares unmeasured confounders with the outcome. Now, I'm gonna ask two questions. First, does the marginal association between S and Y identify the total causal effect of S and Y? The answer is yes. There are two causal paths from S to Y. SY and SLY. Both of these paths are open because they don't contain colliders and we don't condition on any non-colliders. Therefore, oh sorry, and third, the non-causal path SLUY is closed because it contains the collider L and we don't condition on L. Therefore, the marginal association between S and Y identifies the total causal effect of S on Y. And that, of course, makes intuitive sense because that's why we run randomized experiments in the first place. The beauty of a randomized experiment is that the marginal association between the treatment S and the outcome Y identifies the average causal effect. Next question. Does the conditional association between S and Y after controlling for L identify the direct effect of S and Y? Lots of analysts have that intuition. Okay, they regress Y on L and S and then interpret the regression coefficient on S as the direct causal effect of S and Y. But given the DAG that we have on the slide, that interpretation would be inappropriate. It would be inappropriate because L is a collider on a non-causal path from S to Y. Conditioning on L opens that non-causal path such that the conditional association between S and Y now comprises two paths. 
the conditional association between S and Y given L is comprised of the direct causal effect of S and Y and the spurious association between S and Y that flows from S to L to U to Y because we've conditioned on the collider. That is the fundamental problem of mediation analysis. The problem that even in a randomized experiment, mediators are typically not randomized. And if they were, it wouldn't much help us. Therefore, we could ruin an innocent randomized experiment by feeding it into a mediation analysis, unless if we're very, very careful. So at the end of this workshop, I'm going to specify using DAGs what must be conditioned on in order to draw causal mediation conclusions from data. But we're not going to do that now. Now we're going to fill this with content. So here's the birth weight paradox. Um, the epidemiologists in the audience will know this already, may know this. Uh, other, for others, perhaps this is new, but this is a fascinating set of findings. It's discovered exactly a half century ago by Yeroshelmi. Yeroshelmi did research on the effect of smoking on infants. And of course, in the 1970s, it was wild, widely understood already that smoking is likely bad for everything and everybody. So Yeroshelmi found two things. First, maternal smoking is associated with both low birth weight and with higher neonatal mortality on average. That's not surprising, right? Maternal smoking in pregnancy is associated with low birth weight and higher neonatal mortality. But Yeroshalmi also found a second association. When Yeroshalmi analyzed uh, the association between smoking and mortality only among low birth weight babies, he found that among low birth weight babies, maternal smoking is associated with lower mortality. Clearly what's at issue here is the interpretation of the second finding. Should we interpret the second finding causally in the sense that smoking is in fact beneficial for low birth weight babies? Or is the second finding a mythological artifact? Clearly, a lot of rides on this interpretation, right? The association is there. The association has been replicated. There's no question. This is a fact. The question is, should we interpret this association causally, in which case we should tell mothers who are about to give birth to, you know, lightweight babies to start smoking quickly? But maybe we shouldn't. Now, uh, 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 Tyler Vanderweel a few years ago has drawn a simple DAG to hypothesize a solution to this paradox. And there are others before him who've also done this, but I took this DAG from Vanderweel. So here's our DAG. Suppose for argument's sake, uh, to really focus on what's going on, they put in a randomized experiment where, we're, where we have randomized maternal smoking. Now I know we can't do that but I just want to focus on what really matters for this presentation. And I don't want to have to worry about selection into smoking. So let's say that we've randomized smoking. Now smoking affects birth weight, smoking affects mortality, but birth weight and mortality also share other unobserved risk factors such as malnutrition or birth defects. Now this is a DAG. I'm not making assumptions about distributions of functional form here. I'm just saying I believe that smoking affects birth weight one way or the other, and that malnutrition affects birth weight one way or the other. All right. Now, what happens in the in Yerushalmi's analysis is that he looked at the association between smoking and mortality conditional on being low birth weight. This act of conditioning opened the, opened the non-causal pathway from smoking via malnutrition to mortality. 
Now, if this path is negative, the association, right? If this path, S-L-U-Y, is negative, then the conditional association between S and Y given L could become negative even if the direct causal effect of S and Y is positive, right? If the spurious path that we've opened by accident is negative and larger than the positive causal effect of S and Y, then on average, the association between S and Y given L may be negative. So substantively, intuitively, right? If maternal smoking and malnutrition both cause low birth weight, then low birth weight infants whose mother did not smoke likely are malnourished and vice versa. If malnutrition is much worse for mortality than maternal smoking, as it likely is, then low birth weight infants of non-smoking mothers may have higher mortality. And I'm told that this is in fact the now accepted solution to the smoking birth weight paradox. Now, mind you, there were at least 40 years of acrimonious debate in epidemiology about how to make sense of Yerushalmi's birth weight paradox. And all I'm gonna to wanna to point out here is that all it takes is a single graph that we can understand once we know deseparation in order to shine light onto this apparent paradox. I think that's a really amazing contribution here. Uh, not mine, of course, uh, uh, but it's a really uh, important contribution of DAGs uh, um, to uh, explain complicated things so clearly. Good. Now, since we know a new topic, since we know that causal inference requires causal assumptions, it's of course critically important to test one's assumptions as best possible. Uh, I think it's fair to say that most analysts hardly test their causal assumptions unless they're structural equation modelers. A small remaining group of Structural equation modelers are really, really serious about um, testing assumptions, and that's a good thing. Now, here's the amazing thing. Deseparation is powerful because it derives all marginal and conditional independencies implied in the model. So in deseparation, we have a tool to tell us what assumptions are testable and which ones are not. Now, the implied independencies involving only observable variables are testable. So here's an example. Unfortunately, the denser the DAG, the fewer testable implications there are. And that makes sense because you remember that missing arrows are the encode the assumptions. The missing arrows are the exclusion restrictions. And the more arrows we have, in a sense, the fewer assumptions we're making, Sorry, yes, so we, we have less to test. Now suppose that U here is latent. Also suppose that U is observed. So sorry, suppose that U is latent, it's not observed. Then unfortunately, this model here does not have testable implications over the observables. X, T, and Y are gonna be marginally and conditionally associated given each other, right? So. This graph says that X is going to be associated with T, it's going to be associated with Y, T is going to be associated with Y, X is associated with Y given T, T is associated with Y given X, and so forth. There's really no testable independence in here. If, however, U was observed, then we would have a testable implication. We would know that X and U have to be marginally independent of each other. So now we could go to data, perform a suitable statistical test. And if our test rejects independence between X and U, then we would have strong evidence that this DAG is actually not the DAG that's generated the data. Therefore, we would now have to go back and redraw the DAG to become compatible with the data. 
the various software packages that do that, for example, the Dagaby package in R. But this discussion begs an important question. It begs the question of whether we can learn the causal DAG from data alone. That would be wonderful, right? If we have amazing data, and I know many of you have amazing data, you know, sourced from the internet, population level registries, what have you, you have amazing data. Can you hire a machine to derive the DAG from data alone? This is the field of causal discovery. Unfortunately, a basic result in causal discovery is that this task is not achievable. We cannot learn the causal DAG from data alone without making causal assumptions. That's a bummer, right? So here we are, we suddenly have these gigabytes of data but no, the computer can't do, can't derive causal models for us. And just, you know, if you, if you allow me sort of this humanist digression, digression um, it's not terrible, it shouldn't be surprising. Drawing a DAG means to develop causal theory. Computers don't do theory, computers do association. And we should all be thankful for that because if computers could do theory, we'd be out of a job real quick. Now, let me justify this more formally. So here's the reason why we can never learn the causal DAG from data alone. The reason is that causal DAGs have to be well causal. That is, they have to display all common causes of all variables in the DAG. But since there is a near infinite number of potential common causes, one can never test out the absence of all possible common causes empirically. You can't run an infinite number of tests, especially since some of these potential common causes are unmeasured and potentially unknown to science. So yeah, we can't learn the DAG from data alone. So what then with this amazing work in causal discovery? Well, this is amazing work, but the popular causal discovery algorithms that you'll find in various software packages all assume that you observe all variables in the causal DAG. In other words, popular causal discovery algorithms assume away unobservables. In empirical applications, I'm not so sure you want to rely on that assumption, but maybe you have an assumption where you, maybe you have a scenario where you believe that you have no unobserved uh, variables. That'd be great. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's a limitation of causal discovery. Obviously this is a very air active area of research and the name of the game in causal discovery is to figure out how far you can relax the assumption of no unobservables and still get useful or semi-useful results from it. It's a very exciting area and I'm sure there's gonna be many new and powerful results very soon. Good. Let's come to the third part of our workshop, inferring causation from association. So, so far we've done two things. First, we've notated our assumptions. Second, we've asked what associations in the data are implied by our causal assumptions. Now we're gonna go the other way. We're gonna ask, given the causal model, what associations that I can observe in the data actually identify a causal effect? Now, causal identification is a big topic, far too big for this little workshop. So instead of speaking in, you know, sort of highly technical generalities, I want to talk about um, one corner of causal identification analysis that is really, um, that's perhaps the most important one uh, in practice. So 
What we want to do now is determine whether the total causal effect of a treatment or an outcome is identifiable by adjusting for the right set of control variables. So what do I mean by that? Here's the intuitive definition. We say that the average total causal effect or average treatment effect, ATE, we say that the ATE of treatment on the outcome is causally identifiable if it's possible to purge all non-causal association from the observed association between treatment and outcome such that only the causal association remains. Say that again. The causal effect of T and Y is identifiable if we can strip away all the spurious components of the observed association such that only the causal part of the association remains. Now, this is obviously not a formal definition, but it's pretty close and it's exceedingly useful in practice, as you'll see in a second. Now, Ilya Spitzer, um, Tyler Vanderweel, and Jamie Robbins, just 10 years ago, have come up with a way to determine from a DAG whether the average causal effect is identifiable by covariate adjustment. The rule that they've developed is the so-called adjustment criterion. So first I wanna give you a slightly simplified version that makes great intuitive sense. And then uh, the formal version, which is slightly less, but still pretty intuitive. So here's the simplified version. You remember that we've said that the causal effect of T and Y is identifiable if we can strip away all the, all the spurious part of the association such that only the causal effect remains. Well, from that, it's only a very small step to translating things into DAGs, and here we go. Um, the average treatment effect of T and Y is identified by adjustment if we can adjust for a set of observed variables X such that X closes all non-causal paths between T and Y and does not close any causal paths between T and Y. Why does that make sense? It makes sense because what this criterion says is that we, sh we should condition on a bunch of variables so that we can close all the non-causal paths without closing any of the causal paths. What's the result? The result is that the association between T and Y after adjusting for X that remains is the association that flows along the causal paths. There you go. Now more, there's a more formal version here that clarifies that uh, leaving the causal paths open is actually a bit involved, right? So the first part of the adjustment criterion still says that we should control for variables so as to block all non-causal paths between treatment and outcome. But second, we're not allowed to control for any variable on the causal path, because otherwise we'd be controlling where the causal effect, but we're also not allowed to control for any variable that descends from the causal path. The intuition for that is that controlling for a variable that descends from the causal path kind of partially blocks the causal effect that we're interested in. Now, if X meets the adjustment criterion, then we say that X is a sufficient adjustment set. Let me summarize the main concepts that we've learned so far, uh, slightly informally. First, we've learned about deseparation. Deseparation is a property of a path. Deseparation says that no association flows along the path. Then we've talked about independence. Independence is a property of variables. Um, <clears throat> independence between a set of variables means that these variables are deseparated along all paths between them. And finally, we have identification. That's a property of a causal effect. 
we say that causal effects identified if treatment and outcome are deseparated along all non-causal paths, deconnected along all causal paths. And there are other notions of causal identification and there's a little bit of slippage here in what I'm saying, but this is basically it. This is, this is good to remember if this is your first exposure to DAGs. Deseparation is a property of paths. Independence is a property of variables that says that these variables are deseparated along all paths. And identification is a property of a causal effect. And it requires that we've deseparated the treatment and the outcome along all non-causal paths while leaving all the causal paths open. Let's apply the adjustment criterion again to our example of smoking and mortality. First question, can we identify the causal effect of smoking T on mortality Y by adjustment under this model if U is unobserved? Now let's apply the adjustment criterion. The adjustment criterion said that the identification of the effect of T on Y requires that we block all non-causal paths from T to Y while leaving all causal paths open. So the first thing we need to do now is to enumerate all paths between T and Y. And there are five. There's TCY, TCXY, TCXUY, TXCY, TXY, and TXUY. Whoops, that's six. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, <clears throat> I got the numbers wrong, but the analysis is true nonetheless. The key thing to note here is that all non causal paths, oh, sorry, no, the, the numbers are right here. There are six paths total, five of them are non-causal. Okay, so <clears throat> all the non-causal paths from T to Y go through X. X is a non-collider on all of these non-causal paths. And we remember that conditioning on a non-collider blocks a path. Hence, conditioning on X will block all non-causal paths from T to Y, thus preventing any spurious association to flow from T to Y. However, no, sorry, additionally, controlling for X does not block the causal path from T to Y. So we're good. X is a sufficient adjustment set for identifying the causal effect of T and Y. In fact, X is the only sufficient adjustment set in this example, right? Good. Now let's change the question. Let's ask, can we identify the total causal effect of X on Y in this model by adjustment? Again, we apply the adjustment criterion. The adjustment criterion says that in order to identify the effect of X and Y by adjustment, we need to condition on some variables so that we block all non-causal paths from X to Y while leaving all causal paths open. Unfortunately, that's not possible under this model. It's not possible because U is unobserved. Now there's one non-causal path from X to Y that goes through U, X, U, Y. That's a non-causal path. It does not contain a collider and therefore it is open. The only way to close the path X, U, Y would be to condition on U, but we can't do that because U is unobserved. Hence, the causal effect of X and Y in this model is not identifiable via adjustment. Okay, so we've actually seen something interesting here too between these two examples. We've seen that in the given model, it may be possible to identify some causal effects, but not all causal effects. That's generally the case, okay? 
So there's uh, older sort of SEM notions of causal identification that say that a model is identified if every structural parameter in the model is identifiable. That's a very strong notion of identification, which we don't use here. Here, we have a model where the causal effect of T and Y is identifiable via adjustment, but the causal effect of X and Y is not identifiable via adjustment. That's okay. As long as we're modest and we're just interested in the effect of T and Y, we don't care that the effect of X and Y is not identifiable. We'll come back to that later when I talk more about regression. Now, the adjustment criterion, of course, can get unwieldy real quick in large DAGs. Um, uh, there's a bunch of helpful shortcuts that are explained both in Pearl's book and in my uh, um, uh, survey chapter of DAGs, and which are quoted here. Um, uh, some of these uh, criteria include the backdoor criterion, the parent criterion, weak and strong bow pattern criteria. These are all really useful shortcuts that sometimes enable you to just glance at a DAG and tell whether your uh, causal effect of interest is identifiable or not via adjustment. Specifically, the backdoor criterion is really popular because it was uh, the first powerful criterion developed. It was developed by Pearl in his famous 1995 Biometrica article. Um, I'm not going to talk about the backdoor, backdoor criterion here because for all intents and purposes, the backdoor criterion is the same as the adjustment criterion. They differ very slightly. Um, they I discern the same, uh, uh, they, they discern identifiability of the same set of models. And uh, uh, I just find that the adjustment criterion is, is easier to teach. It's more intuitive. So if you really listen to this point to learn the backdoor criterion, just trust me that if you understand the adjustment criterion, you've learned the backdoor criterion and you're fine. Good. Now, what about the parent criterion? Huh? The parent criterion says that adjusting for all parents of a treatment in a causal DAG is sufficient for identification by adjustment should also make sense. So um, anyway, I'm sorry, you can I, I justify that parent criterion here. Um, just believe me, if you can control for all parents of the treatment in the causal DAG, all variables that have direct arrow into treatment, then you have a sufficient adjustment set. Now, what's useful to know about the parent criterion is that uh, is that it captures the popular intuition that you should control for the treatment assignment mechanism, right? You should control for all the variables that cause treatment assignment. But what DAGs tell us beyond that popular intuition is that while it's sufficient to control for the treatment assignment mechanism, it's not actually necessary. And that can be liberating in lots of applications and literature is full of applications where we can't control for the parents of treatment, but we can nonetheless find a sufficient adjustment set in order to do our analysis. Now here's a real gem. The adjustment criterion underlies all causal claims with regression and matching estimators. So what do regression and matching estimators do? They try to control for a bunch or adjust for a bunch of variables in order to isolate some causal effect. And what's been shown is that the adjustment criterion underlies all of these claims in the sense that the adjustment criterion finds all the permissible adjustment sets. What is more, if a set of covariates meets the adjustment criterion, then treatment is conditionally ignorable with respect to the potential outcomes. Now, uh, many in the audience will have heard about conditional ignorability. Others don't. If you haven't, don't worry about it. Um, the point is that the, uh, in the potential outcomes notation of causal inference, 
This statement here is known as conditional ignorability, and it's the um, assumption needed to justify regression or matching estimators. However, understanding conditional ignorability can be really hard, right? Because here we're saying that the set of potential outcomes is statistically independent of treatment conditional on the covariance. This is a very, it's, it's, I mean, it's a maximally succinct statement, but it can be empirically opaque in the sense that it's hard to explain to uh, subject matter experts what on earth this means. The adjustment criteria is the translation rule. The adjustment criterion says that if X meets the adjustment criterion, then treatment is conditionally ignorable given X. So now you don't have to explain to your audience what condition ignorability is anymore. You just have to go to your graph and ask them if they agree with your graph, because once they agree with your graph, you can quietly apply the adjustment criterion and figure out what to condition on. This is a super useful result. Now, what about estimation? Ah, that's its own big topic, right? So I'm just going to gesture at it here. It turns out that if the adjustment criterion is met for the total causal effect of T and Y given X, then that fact immediately implies a non-parametric estimator. For example, so this is a mathy slide, so there's no point of my reading it. I'm just going to point out what we're getting to. For example, if you have a binary treatment and a binary outcome, then we can estimate the, um, uh, the causal effect of switching treatment from zero to one on the probability of having an outcome of y equals one by applying this estimator here. Now this estimator is sometimes known as the non-parametric G formula, but you might also recognize it as the exact matching estimator. What this estimator says is that it asks you to group the data according to the values of X. And then for each cell defined by X, compare the probability of a positive outcome, Y, for people who have received treatment or for people who have not received treatment. Do that for every cell and then average the difference between the outcomes for the treated control across cells defined by X. Okay, so there, I don't know if that's helping the audience here. I've just read a formula. But the fact is that this is the logic, this is the, this is the details of exact matching. So that's super, right? So here we have a, um, an identification criterion that immediately implies a valid estimator. The only rub is that this estimator is often not feasible in real data. It's not feasible because often X is high dimensional so um, you have common support issues. That's too bad. So in practice, when we can't exactly match on X, we need to take this formula and insert functional form assumptions, okay? Maybe we say, ah, oh, we think that the relationship between Y and X is linear in X. And then before long, you're in linear regression. But that's a whole different topic. Going from graphs to regressions is, uh, it's not terribly hard, but certainly beyond this little workshop here. Okay, good. I'll talk more about regression in a little bit. Now in reality, the adjustment criterion often fails. That is, the adjustment criterion will tell you that there is no set of control variables that form sufficient adjustment sets. Especially in observational research, this is very often the case, I think. Now, so for that reason, it's very helpful 
that there's a world beyond adjustment. More powerful graphical identification criteria do in fact exist, including the semi-famous front door criteria. The most powerful identification criterion certainly is Pearl's do calculus published in this, uh, a seminal 1995 biometrica article that's given to you in the references. The do calculus is complete for the causal effects of interventions. That means that the do calculus can detect whether or not the causal effect of a hypothetical external intervention on one or more treatment variables or one or more outcome variables is non-parametrically identifiable relative to your DAG. That's a mouthful, but again, let me tell you what matters here. The adjustment criterion try to identify causal effects simply by adjusting for variables. But sometimes, often, adjustment doesn't work. So the good news is that there are other ways to identify causal effects besides simply controlling or adjusting for a bunch of variable. And all of these ways to um, identify causal effects non-parametrically are captured by the do calculus. What is more, the do calculus can be cast into an algorithm. For example, the, uh, the causal effects package in R does apply the to do calculus to arbitrarily complicated DAGs. Again, this is only for non-parametric identification, but that's an extraordinary achievement. Good. Now we have covered all the technical moving parts that I wanted to capture in this workshop. And I think the, we've captured certainly the three main points about DAGs. We've learned how to use DAGs to notate the causal structure of the data generating process. Second, we've learned how to derive the implied associations of a causal model. Third, we've learned how to figure out whether a causal effect can be identified by adjustment if our data were generated by our presumed DAG. That's a ton. Now I want to give you a entirely subjective selection of uh, applications. There's uh, much more, of course, than both the technical stuff and the, uh, the applications that I'm going to give you now. It would be there's an absolute folly to pretend that a short workshop like this could say everything there is to say about DAGs. It certainly is not. Um, but um, I, I do want to provide you a subjective selection of applications for which I find DAGs useful. Um, and these areas are selection bias, interpreting regression coefficients, mediation, and instrumental variables. So I'm just going to use the stuff that we've learned. I'm going to apply it to these areas. First, let's talk about selection bias. If you remember that selection bias results from conditioning on a collider or a descendant of a collider. Um, Miguel Arnan and colleagues have written a really famous paper on this topic in 2004 with epidemiological examples, um, which of an eye in 2014 have written a paper with lots of social science examples from which I draw here. The fact, uh, what, what's, what I find so liberating here about uh, using DAGs is that they give a unified framework for selection bias. Science certainly is full of examples where conditioning on a collider leads to bias. But every little application has a different name and a different analysis of this bias. So for example, there are literatures on Berkson's bias, on ascertainment bias, on induced confounding, on dependent censoring, on non-response bias, and many more. The fact of these 
DAG-based papers on selection bias is, um, or the point of these papers is, that all of these biases and many more are the same thing structurally. They all result from conditioning on a collider. So now I wanna give you two real examples from the social sciences that I'm especially fond of. So um, uh, you've all heard that you should never select on the outcome. That's true, footnote, unless you're in a case control study and you know what you're doing. Um, but the, gen the rule of thumb is that you should never control for an outcome because it ruins identification. Gronow and Heckman have famously analyzed uh, this problem in economics, and then Heckman has even provided a parametric way to recover from this type of bias, uh, for which, among other things, he's received a Nobel Prize in economics. So let's look at the motherhood wage penalty. The motherhood wage penalty it describes the phenomenon <clears throat> that women who are mothers earn less money on average than women who are not mothers. There's a huge literature on this across the social sciences. And much of this literature suffers a particular kind of bias. In order to highlight that bias, I want to give you a graph here that highlights the problem while abstracting from a bunch of other stuff. So here's the story. Suppose that motherhood comes at random. I know that's a crazy assumption. I just want to abstract from selection into motherhood. Suppose uh, women randomly become mothers or not. Well, so motherhood in the standard economic theory um, uh, uh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. Ah, yeah, here's what we're interested in. We want to know whether motherhood affects employers' wage offers to women. In other words, um, does becoming a mother cause employers to give mothers lower wages? There are various social science theories here related to productivity and discrimination. The social science here is not important. The causal structure of the argument is important. So we're interested in the effect of M on the offer of wages offered to the woman by the employer. And here for argument's sake, I'm uh, assuming that motherhood does not in fact cause offer wages to keep things clear. However, we believe that motherhood affects women's reservation wage. It in fact increases their reservation wage. The reservation wage is the wage offer, this is the lowest wage offer that a woman would accept. Now, if the wage offer exceeds the reservation wage, then the woman accepts employment. That's the story. Now, here's the problem. Social scientists to this day often estimate the causal effect of motherhood and offer wages on samples of employed women. The argument usually is that, well, we don't observe the offer wages for non-employed women, so we're just going to analyze the data that we have. It's not a terribly great justification, but it is a justification that one occasionally sees. So what's happening? If we select our sample on employment, then we are conditioning on employment. But employment is a collider, the only collider, on the non-causal path from motherhood via reservation wage and employment to offer wages. Therefore, even if motherhood is random and does not have a causal effect on offer wages, motherhood and offer wages are going to be associated with each other among employed women. In other words, selecting on employment almost necessarily biases the analysis of the motherhood wage penalty. Now, Gronow and Heckman recognize that, as I've mentioned, Heckman's provided a solution. 
uh, it is uh, remarkable, I find, that one still sees papers on the motherhood wage penalty that don't even mention this problem. Um, how big a problem this is, is of course uh, an empirical question, but I find that by drawing a DAG, it becomes really clear what the problem is. Selecting the sample on employment means that we're conditioning on a collider between the treatment M and the outcome WO, hence inducing a non-causal association between treatment and outcome, um, and hence inducing bias in the analysis. Okay, next example. It is often believed that controlling for pretreatment variables that cannot hurt causal inference. It turns out that this intuition is incorrect. And in fact, there are a number of well-known examples now where controlling for pretreatment pre variable is what biases the analysis. One important class of such examples is latent homophily bias and social network analysis is analyzed by Shalizi and Thomas. <coughs> okay, so here's a slightly more involved DAG than we've seen before. This is a DAG that represents dyadic interactions between two individuals, I and J, let's call them Igor and Jane. Now, if we analyze causal inference in, uh, in social networks, we have to write separate random variables, separate nodes for all actors. And additionally, we have to notate the causal, we have to notate the social structure. We have to notate the network also as a random variable. So here's what's going on. So suppose we're interested um, uh, in the causal effect of Igor's civic engagement at time t on Jane's civic engagement at time t plus one. But maybe we wanna know whether Igor's voting at time t inspires Jane to vote at time t plus one. Now for clarity, I've drawn a DAG here where Igor has no causal effect on Jane to keep things simple. Now, Igor's civic engagement is almost certainly, uh, or civic engagement over time is certainly affected by unobserved factors. For example, Igor's altruism. Similarly, Jane's civic engagement at any point in time is gonna be driven by her latent altruism. So far, so good. How do we connect the two? Well, We've asked whether there's a, uh, uh, whether um, Igor affects Jane, given that they're friends. Uh, we want to know if, if, um, if uh, civic engagement spreads in social networks. Now we got to ask, why are Igor and Jane friends in the first place? Now, uh, sociologists and uh, psychologists have argued for <laughs> over a hundred years that um, uh, friendship networks are characterized by homophily. Birds of a feather sing together. So it may be that Igor and Jane become friends precisely because they're both altruists. Well, if that's the case, then asking whether Igor affects Jane conditional on them being friends means that we're conditioning on friendship right there in the research question. We're conditioning on friendship. Um, so yes, here's a situation where the research question compels conditioning on uh, friendship. And empirical practice is that we usually sample dyads of friends. That is, the data are sampled as a function of f equals one. And now you can see the problem. Because we're sampling dyads, 
Igor's civic engagement is connected to Jane's civic engagement via this non-causal path that's opened by conditioning on the collider F. Hence, Igor's and Jane's behaviors are going to be correlated even if Igor doesn't affect Jane and Jane doesn't affect Igor. They're just associated because Igor and Jane are similar from the get-go. They're latently homophilous. This is a very, very nasty problem in observational uh, uh, network analysis, I guess. So, and Charlies and Thomas 10 years ago wrote this famous article in Sociological Methods and Research that drove this home for all to see. There are, of course, solutions. I'll talk about one solution with instrumental variables by O'Malley and colleagues in a second. The point here is that DAGs, uh, this is essentially Charlies and Thomas's DAG, DAGs really help explaining some very, very difficult problems. Okay, next, let's talk about interpreting regression coefficients. Many empirical researchers run regressions to estimate causal effects. Um, if nothing else, DAGs are really useful for figuring out which regression coefficients identify causal effects and which ones don't. Um, Luke Keel and colleagues have written, uh, published a paper on this recently. Here's, here's how you would use DAGs for this purpose. First, we'd have to commit to a DAG to represent the assumed DGP. Then we have to run a regression model, which implies making um, some commitments to additional functional form assumptions. And then finally, we determine which paths contribute to each regression coefficient. Let's do that here with a garden variety example of wage determination. So suppose that this is the DAG by which gender, education, and exper experience and unobserved ability determine log wages. So here we're saying that gender affects education and experience and wages directly. Education affects experience and wages directly and experience affects wages. Additionally, ability affects how much education the person gets. And of course it affects wages directly because employers may pay high ability people more regardless of their experience, education and gender. Good. Now suppose, suppose that we believe this DGP. And I think this is not a terrible DGP. We could of course make it more complicated, but this serves our illustrative purposes. Now suppose we do the usual thing and estimate a wage regression. So now we're regression log wages on experience, education, and gender. The question is, how should we interpret these regression coefficients? How do we interpret beta one? How do we interpret beta two? How do we interpret beta three? Deseparation helps us figure out how to interpret them. Here's how. So let's look at say the coefficient on experience. What does that coefficient represent? The coefficient beta one captures the association, the covariance, between experience and wages after controlling for education and gender. Now in a graph, we now just have to ask what paths between experience and wages remain open after we've conditioned for education and gender. That's it, deseparation. So let's do that. What's beta one? Beta one captures the association flowing along the open paths between experience and wages, conditional on education and gender. What are these open paths? Well, there's only one open path. The only path between X and W conditional on E and G is the one causal effect of X on W, the causal path. Therefore, 
beta one actually identifies the total causal effect of X on W under this model. Let me see. Oh, yeah, okay. I forgot to say, but it's on the slide that we assume that this DAG represents a linear and homogeneous model. In other words, that this is a path model. Okay, second, what's beta two? Beta two is the coefficient on education. If we wanna know what beta two represents, we need to ask what are the open paths between education and wages after conditioning for experience and gender? Well, there are two such paths. The first open path is the direct causal effect of education on wages. The second open path is the non-causal path from education to ability to wages. Both of these paths are open. Therefore, they both contribute association that is captured in the regression coefficient beta two. That means that beta two does not identify a causal effect. Beta two is a mixture of the direct causal effect of E on W and confounding bias via U. Third, what about the coefficient on gender? What does that capture? Well, beta three captures the association flowing along the open paths between gender and wages, conditional on experience and education. Again, there are two open paths from gender to wages. The first is the direct causal effect. And the second is the selection path, the non-causal path G, E, U, W, that is opened because we've conditioned, we've controlled for the collider education. Therefore, the coefficient on gender does not capture the causal effect of gender on wages, even though gender, of course, is determined randomly, essentially, at conception. I should say that sex is, is determined randomly at conception, okay? So that's really interesting. We run a garden variety wage regression relative to a DAG. And because we know D separation, we can determine which paths in the graph contribute to the regression coefficients. Therefore, we can determine whether each regression coefficient does or does not identify a causal effect. That's a really powerful thing to do. Now, if you do that for a bunch of graphs, you'll quickly find out that it's generally a terrible idea to vest all coefficients in the regression model with causal, um, with a causal interpretation. Usually we're well advised to focus on getting a single co coefficient to identify a desired causal effect and then treat all the other coefficients in the regression model as uh, nuisance parameters that uh, are not of substantive interest. Okay, so again, as I said, the paper um, uh, with uh, Luke Keel and Randy Stevenson is uh, going into much greater detail about this process. Uh, why can't I advance here? Okay, causal mediation analysis. Um, causal mediation analysis is, of course, a frontier of causal inference. Um, DAGs have been instrumental in many methodological developments in causal mediation analysis, starting with one of the early articles in causal mediation analysis by Pearl in 2001, Tyler Vanderweel's uh, recent magisterial textbook published 2015, uh, also makes liberal use of graphs, both for pedagogical purposes and, to, uh, and for proofs. Now, 
Earlier in our workshop, we've already met the fundamental difficulty of causal mediation analysis, namely unobserved mediator outcome confounding. Um, there's more to uh, mediation analysis than this problem. Um, uh, and specifically, I wanna tell you the adjustment criterion for mediation analysis with respect to various mediation estimates. Now, this is not, at this late stage in the workshop, I'm not gonna introduce subtle new um, conceptual notions. Just suffice it to say here that the modern work on the causal mediation analysis that uh, started with Robinson Greenland's seminal paper in the 1990s um, uh, differentiates different types of direct and indirect effects called controlled effects and natural effects, uh, natural direct effects and indirect effects. Now, most analysts use some form of regression modeling to estimate these controlled or natural direct or indirect effects. And if we do this algebraically, it can be kind of hard to see what must be true about the data generating model in order for these regression type models to make any sense. With DAGs, however, it's easy to express the causal identification requ requirements for regression or other adjustment-based estimators. Specifically, the adjustment criteria for mediation are summarized by these four rules. The causal mediation effects of T on Y relative to one or more mediators M are identifiable by adjusting for a set of variables Z if, first, Z does not include any descendants of treatment, Second, Z and M together block all backdoor paths from T to Y. Third, Z and T block all backdoor paths from M to Y. And fourth, Z blocks all backdoor paths from T to M. Now, different causal mediation estimates require different elements of this adjustment criteria. For example, if we're interested just in the controlled direct effect of T and Y, then we just need the first three requirements and we would have to control for Z1 and Z3. If by contrast, we were interested in the natural direct effect or the natural indirect effect via M, we would also need to control for the TM confounders. Okay, so there you go. That's the adjustment criterion for mediation analysis. Uh, if you want to do a mediation analysis using a conventional regression type estimator, these three statements, which can be evaluated relative to a DAG, are sufficient for justifying non-parametric identification results, or right, yeah, non-parametric identification results. And if we want to use a regression estimator, we additionally have to make assumptions about functional form, of course. Good. Finally, instrumental variables. In many real applications, as I've mentioned, identification by adjustment fails because treatment and outcome are confounded by some unobserved variable. Right? So therefore, we would have a non-causal path, t to u to y, which cannot be closed by adjustment. Now, we've already seen that one way of handling such situations would be to go to the do calculus. But the do calculus uh, often will still not be able to identify the effect non-parametrically because it's not possible. Now, in such situations, there sometimes exist so-called instrumental variables that permit the identification of the causal effect of T and Y, not non-parametrically, but under certain functional constraints, such as linearity or monotonicity or a bunch of other criteria. Finding instruments is really hard. DAGs are useful for detecting IVs in complex DGPs. DAGs are also useful for illuminating thorny problems 
in IV analysis, and they're now widely used for that purpose, for example, in epidemiology. So let me illustrate both claims. First, finding IVs. Now there are several subtly different definitions of instrumental variables. Nonetheless, here's a purely graphical definition of an IV. This is due to Pearl 20 years ago. A variable Z, I'm gonna read this. A variable Z is called an instrumental variable for the causal effect of T and Y if conditional on covariates X, there's at least one open path from Z to T, conditional on X. X does not contain descendants of the outcome. And there is no open path from Z to Y conditional on X other than those paths that terminate in a causal path from T to Y. Okay, now, of course, parsing that statement that takes a little bit of work let me just uh, point out that the canonic IV DAG, of course, meets these requirements. Um, and this is very helpful. This is very helpful once you have a situation that's no longer as beautiful as this graph, for example, like this. So remember, uh, we uh, uh, reviewed just a few minutes ago the problem of latent homophily in social network analysis. If I'm interested in how um, the behavior of behavior characteristics of one individual affects the behavior characteristics of another individual, I'm in a social network kind of situation. And here our problem is that. Um, friendships or relationships more generally are not formed at random. So we have latent homophily. Now, a few years ago, O'Malley and colleagues have used Pearl's graphical IV criteria, the one that I've shown you and a bunch of others more powerful ones, to detect IVs in a fairly complex DAG. So this here is the least complicated DAG that they've analyzed and I trust that you'll agree that this does not look like a friendly DAG. The goal here was to figure out whether a person, whether, you know, whether this person's BMI at time T affects the other person's BMI in a subsequent period. The problem was that these people are our friends who were conditioning on friendship. Now, O'Malley and colleagues showed that under this model, adjustment fails. We can't use a regression model to estimate this effect, just like Charlesi and Thomas had said, 2011. However, if G are the represents the genes that influence um, a person's BMI. And if the effect of these genes on people's BMI varies by age, which is captured by the interaction G times X, X containing age, then it can be shown using Pearl's criteria that, um, um, Gx, or, okay, yes. The Gx is an instrument for the effect of y2 and y1 conditional on uh, g and x. Okay. And then they have even more complicated DAGs where this is the case too. Um, yeah, so I think this is a nice application where um, we couldn't have gotten the results that we got um, if we had not been able to draw on graphs to detect instruments in really complicated uh, DGPs. I also claim that DAGs are useful for understanding some problems in IV analysis. And so I wanna illustrate that 
with um, the a problem of selection bias in IV. It turns out that selecting one's sample as a function of treatment necessarily invalidates uh, instrumental variables uh, analysis. So look at the conventional IV graph. Z here is an instrument for the effect of T on Y. That is, under certain additional functional constraints, we should be able to estimate the effect of T on Y using the instrument. But if we condition on or truncate the sample <coughs> as a function of the treatment, that is, if treatment determines sample inclusion, then we're automatically invalidating Z as an instrument for the effect of T on Y. And why is that the case? It's the case because the IV criterion says that the instrument needs to be excluded. That means that Z must not be associated with Y via any path other than the causal effect of T on Y. Note, however, that S is a descendant of T and T is a collider. T specifically is a collider on the path from Z to T to U to Y. Therefore, conditional on S, Z is now no longer excluded relative to Y, meaning Z is not a, ran not, is not a valid instrument. That's been pointed out in a few papers in the last few years. And then, uh, you know, this, uh, this recent paper of ours with Elan Segarra um, actually used DAGs furthermore to develop analytic bias results for uh, this type of selection bias, um, uh, where it turned out that the bias that results from selecting on S in this, as well as in uh, several more complicated graphs, can be neatly rewritten so that it maps directly on the paths that are opened or closed by conditioning on S. That is to say, understanding D separation is really helpful for making sense and you know, providing an, uh, um, a substantive uh, interpretation to really ugly bias formulas. And I think that's a nice thing. Let me summarize what we've done. DAGs clearly uh, are a popular tool for causal inference. The three main uses for DAGs certainly are to notate the causal structure of the DGP, to derive the testable implications of a model, and to perform non-parametric identification analysis. Within and beyond these three main uses, DAGs have also contributed to methodological developments in many fields, only some of which we've reviewed. DAGs have contributed to uh, you know, a deeper understanding in many fields of selection bias, <clears throat> both the problem and its potential recovery. DAGs have been instrumental in driving progress in causal mediation analysis, they're beginning to be widely used for instrumental variables analysis. They have uh, been important for providing new and in fact complete theory of transportability and generalizability and the work I should have cited here, but I haven't of Elias Barnboim and Judea Pearl and colleagues. Um, most recently, DAGs are being used for uh, missing data analysis. And of course, DAGs are important in the field of causal discovery. If you want to learn more about these, um, uh, um, if you want to learn more about DAGs, I, you know, I've listed here a few uh, uh, short uh, or well longer online courses, uh, both by myself and by Miguel Hernan, and a few uh, papers that are you know, at a slightly higher technical level than what I'm doing here. And then of course, um, uh, you know, the most technically inclined should, uh, should go to Pearl's 2009 book, Causality, and to Matthew Sedal's recent 
uh, textbook, not, not textbook, a handbook of graphical models that captures everything that I've talked about uh, in, in a fairly mathematical manner and lots of additional topics beyond that. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, bye-bye.